You know, I am so sick and tired of telling people that Dark Souls 2 is my favourite game of the series. Let me elaborate. Unpopular opinions happen. Some people like pineapple on pizza. Some people think Michael Bay struck some serious storytelling gold with the Transformers series. Some people even prefer Digimon to Pokemon. And you know what? That's fine. Often when I hear an unpopular opinion, I say, oh, okay, cool. Uh, can I pay for my sandwich now? Sometimes I might laugh a bit at the ludicrous notion that this is somehow a taboo admission. Sometimes I ask a couple of questions just so that they don't feel so awkward about it. Sometimes I level with them and make some empathetic statement. Oh, well, I guess it's just cool right now to dislike pineapple on pizza. I don't think anybody cares that much. I don't really care that much in the first place, honestly, so it's no skin off my bones. However, if you're in any way involved in the gaming sphere, you'll know that those laws don't apply here. Because if you play games and sometimes even have the gall to talk about them, you might find yourself on the receiving end of some very horrifying comments about your mum. In the real world, it might be the social norm to just politely nod and move on to the next conversation. In the game world, it's nothing personal, kid, but you're going down. You see, I'm a bit of a baby. If I was a meal, I'd probably be mushy peas. Why? Because I really hate disagreeing with people on things. I love bonding with others over shared interests in some big opinion circle joke, and yet I have the worst opinions about everything and I'm always bound to get into some debate. I didn't think Undertale was particularly groundbreaking or even especially great. I think The Elder Scrolls Oblivion is better than Skyrim and much more fun than Morrowind. I think Artorias is quite a boring fight. Portal was an okay gimmick demo that wrapped up fast enough so as to not be shit, but it still wasn't an especially 10 out of 10 game. I think Fortnite is a completely okay game to play, and I like all the dancers. And yet, I am some damp little social teddy bear that needs a constant squeeze of reassurance all the time. I don't mind if people have different opinions, but I do get that buzz when I'm bonding with someone else over something completely unimportant. The random yet formidable brick of inspiration hit me today because I wanted to give my honest opinion on Dark Souls 2. I wanted to have a good Good old bitch about some of its more glaring flaws, but also brag many of its glowing attributes, and in the process compare it to other games from the Souls series. I did this because I'm ready to be a mature adult about one of my favourite games and have a proper sit down discussion. And also because some randomer on Twitch just called me a fucking idiot, and I need to blow off some steam. So, to flesh out this subject matter a bit more for the 80% of people who will be watching this just to have something on in the background while they do something way more interesting like paint or exercise or make quick love to their wife, Dark Souls 2 is a game developed by From Software, released in March of 2014. Reviews from critics were pretty glowing, but the customer reception was about as mixed as a public toilet and equally as full of surprises. Three DLCs, The Crowns of the Sunken, Old Iron and Ivory Kings respectively, were released in the following months and the whole package was eventually bundled up, tied together, and sold as the sexy older sister of the base edition, Dark Souls 2 Scholar of the First Sin, which also received some pretty significant enemy and level layout changes. I'm not the kind of lumbering fool that believes reviews can ever truly be unbiased, but I am going to examine this game as evenly as possible, and try to keep my personal opinions to a minimum, or at least give you a clear warning when they're coming so you can jam your fingers in your ears and scream loudly until we're back to the facts. This video will cover the game mechanics, combat, bosses, level design, storytelling, and structure and DLC, and I'll discuss the ways in which Dark Souls 2 approaches, builds upon, and either succeeds or fails in, especially where I felt it received some pretty unwarranted criticism. Anyway, let's get started. And if you enjoy the video, please like, subscribe, and even share. It really, really helps. You know what they say, if you can dodge a wrench, you can dodge a ball. But no one can dodge how differently Dark Souls 2 plays compared to the rest of the games in the series. Within the first few hours of the game, you'll see that Dark Souls 2 has taken a severe mechanical detour from the original, that it's swerved right off the road and is now careening through some farmland. Esther's flasks, the old reliable of Souls-likes, make another appearance, but you only start with one. You can piece together a sturdy collection by finding shards scattered around the world though, kind of like an easter egg hunt, except you're looking for bits of dirty old broken glass. An extra four of them are available within the first few hours of the game, but unless you're some sort of rummaging Ralph, you'll probably need to rely on word of mouth or a plucky young wiki page to find them. On the topic of word of mouth, Dark Souls 2 was birthed screaming into this world with a new very understated, very shy little stat, agility, which considering how similar it sounds to dexterity semantically, will likely be shoved aside in favour of power levelling strength like a real chad should. What most, if not all, new players didn't know is that agility 
is paramount to your first Dark Souls 2 playthrough. It speeds up your healing animations, because your character takes decades to chug an Estus at first, and increases the duration of your invincibility during a roll. As some attacks are so slow, or have insane lingering hitboxes, and so can't be dodged properly until your agility is in the mid to late 90s. You can level this stat by accident if you're levelling Attunement, which is a stat that gives you more slots for spells, pyromancies, hexes and miracles, and for some reason also levels agility by proxy, but that would require you to run a magic build, and most people aren't yet so woefully unhappy as to bother. It's almost reminiscent of the absolute hellfire that is starting GTA 5 online for the first time. You will fly into a world of hostile, spiteful players sometimes hundreds of levels higher than you, with access to only the most basic weapons and utterly rock bottom stats. You can only earn better stats by proving you don't need them, by winning against those aforementioned GTA goliaths in minigames, where the odds are stacked against you by default, and they all have rocket launchers. I guess we can count our lucky stars that the pursuer doesn't have an oppressor. Except you don't earn Estus or ADP, you wait for some redditor to tell you about them. On the flip side, Dark Souls 2 does introduce a fairly new mechanic, life gems, which restore health over a prolonged period of time, but are an infinite resource if you have the souls to buy them, as long as you know how to make that source infinite, which admittedly I didn't on my first few playthroughs, but that's because I grabbed Lenin's key from Melentia the Hag and fucked right off before she could ask me to help her with her Wi-Fi router, or to grab her something off the top of the wardrobe. This does create an interesting toss-up between using souls for crucial formative levelling, or to bolster your inventory with life gems. Some people might think this is a good deliberation, and some people might think it's bad, and that's as unbiased as I can get on this topic. In some weird awkward combination of Dark and Demon Souls, bonfires do return, but act as warp points between areas of the map and can't be used to level up at. Instead, you're gifted this adorable Irish waifu who sits around and kicks her legs and looks at the ocean, so you can visit her whenever you need to get it up. Your level, I mean. Warpable bonfires from the beginning do raise one very serious miracle user-shaped problem, but we'll talk about that later. On the whole, warping is a hugely helpful accompaniment to a storyline that allows a player to go any of four directions from the get-go, only to narrow itself down into a single route at the halfway point of the story. Personally, I think it would be fine to just have the primal bonfires be warpable, so you can commit to moving forwards or head backwards if you've gone to an area to do cleanup. but warping between every bonfire doesn't ruin the experience, so I'll give it a break. Aside from reintroducing old mechanics, Dark Souls 2 produced a few of its own. Some great, some terrible. One particularly shitty idea is soul memory, a concept I can only assume was imagined by some weird inebriate who wanted to ban all fun for all time. I guess it was created to stop the absolutely insane twinking of Dark Souls. The way soul memory functions is that you can only co-op within a certain soul range, soul range being the gross amount of souls you've received throughout your entire playthrough. So if your buddy puts in some overtime and goes five souls over the limit, you'll have to catch up with them before you can co-op again, and honestly that just makes you look a bit clingy. They did add the Agape Ring in Scholar of the First Sin, but the Agape Ring stops you from earning any more souls, period, which means that you have to choose between levelling and co-op, which for a first time player isn't going to be on the cards. I'll give the Dark Souls 2 haters this one, it was ass, undeniably, it was ass. Another mechanic introduced was enemy despawning. If you are genuinely so terrible at the game, you can whack your head against the same enemies over and over and over again, and after about 12 to 15 attempts, they'll just stop respawning. This means that in some particularly heinous boss run-ups, you can clear the area beforehand to make it easier if you have an hour spare, and it also serves to stop you from grinding in the same place for too long, encouraging forward movement, which I like. You can have infinitely respawning enemies if you join the Covenant of Champions, in the same way that you can have some delicious hospital meals if you get hit by a bus. The Covenant of Champions was a new covenant added to Dark Souls 2 that greatly boosts the attack and aggression of enemies, but makes them respawn infinitely and also increases their drops, especially if you're farming offline. I didn't make much use of this except in the PS3 version of Dark Souls 2, where I needed to grind sunlight medals from the falconers and things betwixt, because no one was playing the game anymore. In the process of researching this video, I trawled through a lot of opinion pieces on Reddit, clearly the least biased source I could find, obviously, and I saw so many people complaining. Dark Souls 2 sucks! The despawning enemies force you to completely change your approach to a level. You can clear an area if it's too hard, so it becomes less of a barrier to overcome. They may have well have called this game slow souls, combat is so much slower, healing and rolling sucks, and I can't use my shield like I could in the first game. Dark Souls 2 is shit. Not having a full set of Estus from the get-go, or kindling ability, meant that I had to be way more careful until I could find some. Also it fucked my girlfriend. It is always, the game made me approach it differently, not necessarily for better or for worse. The game was different, but it was great, but it was called Dark Souls, and that's its most cardinal sin. That and fucking that poor guy's girlfriend.
So with all that custard in the glove box, why do people still love Dark Souls 2? Because the combat is better than sex. Not that any of us would know. We are too busy with PvP. You see, Dark Souls 2 introduced some very interesting new dynamics to weapons and combat. Hybrid weapons, like Santier's spear, are weapons similar to a glow stick in the way it was made faster and more effective once broken, thus rendering it unbreakable. Twin blades, a glaive with a blade on each end, were added as a unique weapon type and then never used again, despite how unbelievably dope they were. Some weapons were interesting easter eggs or references to previous games, like the Majestic Greatsword, Artorius's old beater, now having peacefully retired to Broom Tower. As the namesake knight was left-handed, so is this weapon, which can only be used effectively when wielded in the left hand, leaving your right hand free to send foul DMs when you've inevitably been parried to death by your opponent. New armour sets also had crazy details. The Jester set, the Iron Wanzi, made backstabbing impossible, tossing a wrench into the machinations of PvP. Gower's Ring put a weird little naked man on your back, a sensual and extremely titillating surprise, and the Xanthus set made real the dreams of every player who wished to one day cosplay as a dirty Q-tip. The sheer number of dude bosses and enemies, such as the Fume Knight, Vengal, and the Smelter Demon, meant an abundance of badass knight-esque armour sets. Except for the Pursuers, which was a shame so real that it still brings me to tears. Magic users weren't neglected either, unlike in Dark Souls where they were basically asked to pick their favourite bathrobe. With the advent of the Hexa set, Strayed's Black set, and the Black Witch set, Dark Souls 2 allowed you to pick your favourite gothic bathrobe, a far more exciting choice. And for those of you who thrive when moist, the Pharos's mask was created with you in mind. Finally, and perhaps most relevantly, power stancing was the absolute ace up Dark Souls 2's sleeve, a combat mechanic so popular that it was a clear inspiration for the weapon arts of Dark Souls 3. Some animations even copied wholesale because they were just that great. Essentially, you could dual wield almost any weapon in the game, and with the correct stats, do crazy attacks to impress your friends, colleagues, and loved ones. And now that we've cleared all the custard out of the glove box, let's ask another question. Why do people who played the first Dark Souls first always seem to hate the second? The short answer is because they were so set in their ways that they didn't notice they were being actively punished for relying on their old tricks and instead misinterpreted it as bullshit difficulty. But I doubt you clicked on this video if you were looking for a short answer, so here we go. Yes, Dark Souls 2 made a galaxy brain move by completely alienating the existing community and their established tropes and expectations. This came mainly in two forms, stamina mismanagement and shield effectiveness. In Dark Souls 1, squatting behind your shield like an environmental protester on a green belt is a very real and legitimate strategy. I don't know what shields were made of in Dark Souls, but you could block damn near anything forever. The first time I heard about Dark Souls, some guy from my uni course was telling me about how he just dual wielded the tower shield and walked through the game with it. This is probably because stamina in Dark Souls 1 is basically an infinite resource. Once it's depleted, you need only step back a bit and it'll shoot back up like a pensioner triple dosing on Viagra, which is amplified to ridiculous levels with the use of stamina regenerating equipment like the grass shield. If your stamina is depleted, not that it ever will be, you'll be staggered for a moment, but you'll probably never find yourself in a situation where you're ever overwhelmed. Just remember to speak to a healthcare professional if your stagger lasts longer than four hours. Players who relied on these strats coming into Dark Souls 2 were in for an absolute baptism by fire, and those who assumed the game was bullshit and broken because these stats were no longer encouraged missed out on a fucking good game. In Dark Souls 2, shields are way less of a utility, especially at lower levels. You'll probably only be able to tank one or two hits before your character is staggered, dramatically throwing their arms up in the air in a painful slow motion. At this point, an enemy will usually just step in for the kiss. I mean, kill. Shields, specifically great shields, do become useful, but you do need enough points and strength to use them, so they're far more niche and only really seen at later levels. This is because stamina has been majorly nerfed in Dark Souls 2, even if you slap all of your levels into it going into the game, and it regenerates way slower. If you're blocking with a shield, that slow regeneration somehow manages to slow even more, and you'd have better luck waiting for the inevitable heat death of the universe than a full stamina bar. Even when attacking, you can only fire off a few smacks before your stamina depletes, so you have to be careful and not waste that stamina on blocking. Many early bosses like the Pursuer and the Flexile Sentry hit hard and hit fast, and seem to be there solely to punish players who play slowly and defensively, an outlook on combat that FromSoft experimented with here but later probably established with Bloodborne. Except Bloodborne was its own game and was released unhindered by the expectations of previous titles in a non-existent franchise. I wonder how many Dark Souls players would have stuck around once they realised how fun it can be to two-hand their weapon and go to town. Or roll to town. Probably none of them, since most wrote it off before they even reached the first boss. Or maybe they just wrote it off as soon as they realised there was no point down emote.
If Dark Souls 1 and 3 were the PS4 and Xbox One respectively, Dark Souls 2 is the Wii. And if Dark Souls 2 is the Wii, then Dark Souls 2 bosses are Wii Sports, the only thing you're interested in the console for in the first place. And Matt is the Fume Knight. Dark Souls 2 cast a wide net when it made its roster of bosses, introducing almost double the number of bosses featured in Dark Souls 1, which had 27, and Dark Souls 3, which had 25, DLC included. Dark Souls 2 picked quantity over quality. It boasts over 40 bosses total, with quality that deviates from shockingly bad to surprisingly good, for more reasons than any YouTube video could ever dream to cover. If I wanted to highlight the problem with Dark Souls 2 bosses as efficiently as possible, and I do because I don't want you to get bored and leave, I'll probably tell you the story of Blight Town. Have you heard this one? Good. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm gonna tell it anyway, but okay. There once was a little undead who didn't grab the master key on character creation and instead had to fight an enormous toothy dragon for it. Turns out the dragon is probably easier than the character creation, so this smug undead swaggered down to Blight Town with an inflated ego. Little did they know, eh? Little indeed, because they were swiftly pummeled to death by the Dung Pie Gang, who smashed their head in with a splintered rolling pin, only to come back and be poisoned by the toxic dart team. And then they met some lovely lizard men who beat them to death with the corpses tied to sticks. All I'm saying is, it probably took them a while to get down into Blighttown. This little undead crept across rickety wooden platforms, hopped around hidden gaps in the floor, and scattered themselves across treacherous bridges, burning through their supply of tasty purple moss. The route here was unclear, and the enemies seemed so much more aggressive than anything the undead had faced so far. After much time on the upper floor, the chosen undead discovered the first bonfire perched up on the aqueduct. The sun shines on their face here, peeking over the Great Wall, and they survey their surroundings before they move on. This place seems harsh, but they've come too far now to back down. But then the undead met some fire-breathing dogs, and all bets were off. Shield up at the ready, the chosen undead crept down, down, down through Blighttown, dropping through the scaffolding that climbed the walls of the depths like big vines, down ladders and through tunnels stopping briefly to be painfully skewered by the big red bug thing. Down towards the floor of the swamp the undead crept, discovering infinitely respawning mosquitoes and huge bugs that somehow knew pyromancy, and of course more toxic darts, because of course. Upon landing on the weirdly sandy shore of the swamp, the undead looked out. Well, the undead swatted away some more infinitely respawning mosquitoes and then looked out. To their left was an enormous, opposing tree, trunk reaching high above the swamp. That probably wasn't important. Beyond that tree, behind it who knows, to their right, in the distance was a huge, weird white hill, covered in strange, gnarled roots. It was all too easy for the undead to miss the bonfire here, tucked away in a little cave on the right wall. They toddled on, discovering a whirring wooden contraption, an elevator, which they would eventually realise led back to Firelink Shrine. Now, probably on their last estus, the undead begins to hurry across the swamp, quickly becoming poisoned as they wade through the sludge. They rediscover the Dung Pie Gang, now with added boulders, and, should they not be immediately brained, might just find a weird hole in the strange white hill and slip inside, into this extremely innocent, harmless looking lair. I mean, hill. At the end of this slog, hours and hours of deaths and retries and toxic and struggle, maybe even including an accidental escape from Blighttown, maybe the chosen undead ventured up the curious lift to be killed by the undead dragon in the valley above, or charged full pelt into the new Londo lift and fell down into the shaft below. Don't worry undead, we've all been there. By the time they've dragged themselves down into Keylag's lair, past her boss fog and gazed upon the cutscene, the undead is well aware that another loss, another death, will have them kicked back to the last bonfire on their arse. It's enough to make a man sick, and Keylag isn't easy either, so that potential is very, very real. When they finally claim victory, it's like they've triumphed over everything. Not just Keylag, the undead has conquered the Great Swamp, Blight Town, the Depths, everything. And how many other bosses in Dark Souls 1 offer that same buzz? The actually quite easy Iron Golem camps at the top of Sen's Fortress like some sweaty dick. Ornstein and Smo are the only mandatory boss in the entire sprawling mess of Anor Londo, and even Pinwheel dominates the catacombs, for better or worse. In Dark Souls 1, bosses act as a full stop to the long, winding, trailing sentence. In Dark Souls 2, bosses are the commas. The route from Blighttown to Lost Isolith is pretty similar in structure to the route between Harvest Valley and Iron Keep, so we'll compare them. If the old Iron King, God rest him, is in this metaphor the bed of chaos, which is a horrible insult in and of itself, then that would make Mitha the baneful queen, Chaos Witch Keyleg. It's pure coincidence that they're both amalgamations of woman and animal. In this metaphor, the depths would parallel the Harvest Valley, a place that, to the uninitiated, probably sounds like a beautiful portmanteau of Harvest Moon and Stardew Valley. It is not. It is a trap. Then it's an utterly gruelling slog along the sheer cliff edge of the aforementioned valley that actually feels more like a fissure in the earth, some ancient leftover of tectonic movement, like a relic depicting a builder's arse crack. And just like a builder's arse crack, you're in for a few surprises. Ambushes lie in wait all the way along the internal wall, thieves and rogues lying in little caves to jump on your 
back as you walk by. You get to the boss fog through hell or high water. Maybe you've run back through the spooky cave to unlock the bonfire, maybe you haven't. You're weighing up your options. Go back and grab some more Estus, or push forward into the strange old temple and face the unknown. Deliberations aside, you eventually duck your head through the fog wall and come face to face with the skinniest folk band you've ever seen. You make quick work of them and their roadies. So quickly it feels like there's going to be some secret second phase, but there isn't. Just a silence so thick you could motorboat it. Underwhelmed, but undeterred, you stumble out and find a bonfire. Rest up and venture on, coming to a huge windmill, Earthen Peak. The next bonfire is less than a minute away, if you know what you're doing, and you can rest up again with probably almost all of your Estus intact. Then you pelt inside the windmill, up some stairs, and another boss fog. Oh, okay. Cover to steam and down, and then another bonfire. Cool, like, I guess. It's then only a few more moments until you take Mitha on, and she's not too bad, I suppose. But she's no key leg, and the bonfire is a pubic hair's length away in plain sight, so there's no tension. Do you see what I'm getting at here? Well, this is pre-recorded, so even if you did, I wouldn't know. So, for the sake of argument, the bosses of Dark Souls 2 are always miles easier than the areas leading up to them. The bonfires in between always so abundant that no tension ever builds. No nail-biting worry that as soon as you die, you'll get shipped back to a checkpoint miles behind you. It was that anus clenching stress that worked so well for the first game, that tension you could cut with a knife. When you were completely silent, lean forwards in your chair and stare intently at the screen without blinking until the fight is over. When you do kill a boss, it's about as disappointing as a takeaway McDonald's. There's no rush of relief, no feeling of conquering the area, no orgasmic break in the tension, all the things you'd typically expect from a McDonald's. Just some sad little undead strolling over to the exit. There's nowhere for the frustration to go. Having just heaved yourself through a super tough area and then been birthed on the other side, screaming and covered in blood, you feel like something is missing. No need to recover, to take stock, you just move on to the next one. Some bosses, like the Smelter Demon, the Pursuer and the Belfry Gargoyles, actually really effectively recaptured this magic. Other bosses, like Velstat, the Royal Aegis and the Demon of Song, lie in wait as the sole bosses at the end of their respectively gruelling areas, and so would have done the same had they been much harder as bosses themselves. The Fume Knight and the Burnt Ivory King are tough enough to merit having a bonfire right close by without detracting from the experience. And the Old Iron King, Sin the Slumbering Dragon, and the Chandra at least offer a cool spectacle if nothing else. Even the Lost Sinner, Alana the Squalid Queen, and the Rotten are at least interesting fights. Like the gravy poured onto a delicious Christmas dinner, they're not exactly the source of the sustenance, but they're very welcome. That being said, I do, surprise surprise, have some nitpicks. Some of the later boss experiences are a bit pissy, in part due to the fact that the hitboxes can be a bit funny. The Fume Knight's forward thrust will randomly hit you even if you're standing next to him or behind him. Like you're taking splash damage from the sweat I reckon he's built up under that armour. The Burnt Eye King has loads of attacks that barely feel like they connect. Not in a cool anime swordsman way, but more just like he clipped through you and you're taking damage anyway because why not? Even among the core fandom, there's a consensus that the Ancient Dragon has an utterly illegal amount of health. The game also relies on silly gank fights like the Gank Squad, Ludden Zalin, the Royal Rat Authority, and the Throne Watcher and Defender, which chase you around relentlessly at your exact movement speed because there's nothing to break up aggro. The best double fight of the lot, if you can count it, is Dark Lurker, but he's hidden behind this silly decision to make the player pay a human effigy every time they want to fight him, which means few players will bother to discover him and even less will take the fight to the finish, not that you're even told about him in the first place. Speaking of poor communication, the game also randomly shoehorns in some really wacky hidden gimmicks, the likes of which you'd need to be really obsessed with the set dressing to discover without needing to be told. Everyone's favourite Gwyn lookalike Vendrick has 32 times his normal defence if you attempt to fight him without any giant souls in your inventory. These items are picked up in endgame areas, all of which you visit after discovering Vendrick for the first time, none of which you find naturally, and none of which are alerted to in any way, shape or form, even after you pick them up, so you'll probably just cash them in for some quick and easy souls. Sorry to harp on Mytha too, but she's got a big old poison pool in her arena, which poisons you if you stand in it, but causes her health to regenerate at an eyebrow raising rate. Know how you remove it? By setting fire to the windmill. The metal windmill. By doing this you somehow cause all of the poison pools in the building to dry up or maybe drain away? Or maybe Mytha gets too hot so she has to drink it all? This is a mechanic that has never been used in the game before and you'd have to be pretty obsessed with the cut of that big metal jib to even bother going near it with a torch.
Dark Souls 2 was the first Dark Souls game I played, and when I booted it up on my old faithful Xbox 360, I knew to expect only one thing. Behind every fog wall is a boss. So when I landed in things betwixt and started venturing through the level, getting ceremoniously eaten by the ogre, as you do, and dying to it so many times that my health literally halved, I left the firekeeper's hut in a state of what you might call pant-shitting terror. I tiptoed up the narrow walkway, looking left and right, to see only fog walls. If the ogre is just a standard enemy in the game, I pondered, then what kinds of bosses are waiting for me behind these fog walls? In short, I was so scared that I skipped the tutorial. As a result, I toddled into Medulla, irritated the three little pigs, and was chased around the town for a few minutes. Tried to retaliate without realising that my menu was open, saw that I had an axe in my inventory, couldn't quite figure out what to do with it, didn't realise my game wasn't paused, and died. So I put the game away for a long time. I don't necessarily have a point to make here, I just wanted somebody to know. I actually wanted to talk about something way more relevant here. Pokemon Emerald. Not the remake, god no, but the original 2004 Game Boy Advance game. Personally, I think it could have taught Dark Souls 2 a lot about subtly telling a story. Yes, that Pokemon Emerald. Why, well you see, Pokemon nowadays is definitely not short on dialogue. As most players can attest, it's usually pretty redundant dialogue too. Typically wrenching you out of gameplay every 10 minutes for a cutscene like a dog on a leash, to force you to sit through some inane dialogue, usually expositing information you've figured out yourself or have already been told in another pointless cutscene 15 minutes ago. However, back in the original few generations of Pokemon, there wasn't enough space on the cartridge for a inane conversation. Story had to be told in a different way, through many different mediums than just dialogue, like spelling out a safe combination using only roadkill. The overworld had to direct the player in the correct way by encouraging forward movement, enticing the player forward with the promise of more interesting Pokemon, and limiting certain routes until techniques, items, or extra abilities had been earned, whilst maintaining a familiar comfort zone. Like putting medicine in your dog's food, Game Freak guided the player without them ever knowing. Let me show you what I mean. In Pokemon Emerald, your character begins in their hometown of Little Root, bids goodbye to their weirdly hot mum, and heads north. You can't head east down the passage of water because you can't swim, so you head west through Petalburg City, where you meet your father and he tells you to come back later. Thanks, Dad. Heading further west, you find a boat on the shore, but no one to speak to about getting a free trip, so your only choice is to go north through the forest to Rustbro Town. You have a gym to battle, and some random CEO asks you, a random ten-year-old, to deliver some important letter to his mystery son. Heading north from here is an accessible, but you can head east to Rustbro Tunnel, which is also inaccessible. Okay. But the boatman is here. The captain? It's only a small boat. What size does a boat need to be for you to be a captain? I don't know. The sailor is here. You give him a hand and he offers you a free boat trip, conveniently. Taking him up on his offer opens up a whole other third of the map, accessible via water. More specifically, you can now visit Duford Town and Slayport City at your leisure. Since there's nothing left to do here besides catch kittens, you head to Duford Town to beat the gym and explore the cave northwest of the city, where you meet the CEO's mystery son, Stephen. You hand him the letter, he exposits a bit, gives you some useful shit, and then leaves you alone in a pitch black cave by yourself. Thanks, Stephen. Slateport has some plot mumbo jumbo, but nothing in particular to note. So if you head north through Moorville, which you'll soon learn functions as crossroads of sorts on this map, you can't head east yet because it's a body of water, so you head north. Too far north and you hit a desert, inaccessible still. From here, you can head through the volcano to the northernmost part of the map, Fall Arbor Town, the city of falling ash. Hear about a local science man being held captive and head over to Meteor Cave, where you can challenge the bad guys of this game, Team Magma, to have this man returned to you. You're told that things are running amuck at the volcano, and left again. From here, you can head south through the cave and you come out at Rustboro City. This was the inaccessible route north from the city. From here, you can also head east and finally break the boulders in Rustboro City to return to Morville Town. You head up through the volcano, defeat the bad guys, and to Lava Ridge for another boss fight, at which point you'll be given goggles that grant access to the desert, and can now loop through this area in more depth. You'll now also be able to surf, and you'll be asked to visit New Morville, a previously inaccessible location on the sea. You will also be able to swim back to the body of water next to your hometown, from which it's only a few easy steps in the direction of Petalburg, where you can now challenge your father. Learning to surf also opens up the whole right half of the map to you. Do you see what I'm getting at? You loop through the map over and over again in Pokemon Emerald, each item you earn and each ability you learn only increasing the size of the loops you can do, or allowing you to loop through areas in more depth, uncover increasingly buried intrigue, you orbit around the centre of the map rather than pelt off in different directions, unlocking more techniques, Pokemon and locations, but always finding yourself back right at your comfortable centre. Suddenly dropping back into an area and recognising it immediately is something that Bloodborne and the first half of Dark Souls did really well. Maybe I should have used those as examples instead. I think Pokemon is a good example here because, just like the Souls series, Pokemon needed to adapt to being unable to offer much direction and exposition through words. Yes, Pokemon didn't have a choice in the 
the matter due to constraints of the technology, whereas the Soul series chooses to, despite being able to offer more insight if they wanted. But it's easy to see how both series adapted to delivering direction without telling you explicitly what to do. This implicit guidance is something that Dark Souls 2 really lacked, probably as a consequence of the sudden changes late in development. Why am I bringing this up? Because there's an elephant in the room. Well, actually, elephant is probably a really rude way to describe Lycia. I know she's a snooty bitch, but fat shaming isn't a productive method of dealing with her. A quick backstab should do the trick. According to Dark Souls Beyond the Grave by Damien Mechery, awesome book I heartily recommend, Dark Souls 2 was originally supposed to be far similar to Demon Souls in world design. There would be a hub world, similar to the Nexus, and you would be able to teleport between the four main early game locations, Sinner's Rise, Black Gulch, Iron Keep, and Brightstone Cove Seldora, presumably with all of our other favourite places jumbled in there somewhere like Pick and Mix. Very late into development, this concept was scrapped, and the pieces of the game that had been built and polished now needed to somehow be spliced together into a sprawling open world, having now to force these jagged edges to mesh smoothly. This is where one very famous conflict between level design and warpable bonfires came into play. Whilst exploring Hyde's Tower of Flame, you would encounter a miracle merchant by the name of Lycia. Most players would write her off, because pyromancy is clearly way cooler than boring miracles, and consequently forget about her like they forget about most merchants that sell irrelevant items. Actually, you needed to exhaust Lycia's dialogue, then know to return to the rotunda room outside of Majula, a place you would have seen for only a second or so on your way to Hyde's Tower, and speak to her here to pay her to rotate the room, at which point you can access a whole new quarter of the map. Considering you warp back to Majula after getting to the end of Sinner's Rise, you never need to backtrack through here, so you'd never see her unless you went out of your way to meticulously search everywhere for your next step. I mean, once you know, you know, but I've watched Twitch players search for ages, beyond anything productive or fun, all the way to the ends of Brightstone Cove, the Black Gulch, the Lost Bastille, trying to find the clue that was right under their nose all along, and not even being relieved or amused when they finally found the answer. It was just poorly communicated considering it's an utterly crucial step in the game. It wasn't an oh moment, but an ugh moment, and I feel that in my soul quite, quite strongly. I mean, it's not all that ridiculously miscommunicated. In fact, the mashed togetherness of Dark Souls 2 really drew me to the game. Well before I knew it was an actual problem stemming from a lack of development time, the game to me felt so fantastical, so otherworldly and dare I say convoluted, that I could climb the windmill in Earthen Peak and suddenly find myself at the epicentre of a volcano. Considering the crazy shit you see throughout the game, huge pillars of rock near Aldia's Keep, the Dragon Eyrie itself, it never occurred to me for a single second that it was weird that I had just manifested inside a volcano. For some people, the unrealistic nature of this game game was a deal breaker. For me, it was a highlight. Compared to the story that Dark Souls 3 centred around, this game was a fucking Shakespearean tale. I've said a million times that I wish Dark Souls 3's story had been based around the Ringed City, a far more interesting location and premise, rather than just a sequel to the story of Dark Souls 1 that was neither needed nor asked for. Dark Souls 2 was an original story loosely fitting the mould of the original game. Whilst deviating into its own storylines and establishing its own characters and philosophy, Dark Souls 2 answered so many questions about Dark Souls one, but in doing so raised a hundred more, many we will never know the answer to. What is the maelstrom at the start of Dark Souls 2? A metaphor for the loss of oneself, or a real place? If it is, then what does that make Drang Lake? Is it a portal through time, or space, both, or neither? Is Drang Lake a painted world? If so, what does that mean for Aldia? And why does a fire still need to be linked to maintain it? Why does the cycle manifest here too? Can the cycle of light and dark ever be escaped from, or will it follow humanity wherever it goes? Early on in your playthrough, you'll likely encounter Strayed of Olafis, who, besides being an enormous prick, calls to your attention the sheer time gone by since Lord Ran even stood. Millennia have passed, whole civilizations have risen and fallen. In this world we inhabit now, so far in the future that hundreds of flames have been lit, thousands, are we even in the same cycle of light? Has the flame failed to be linked? Have we had an age of man, an age of dark, even an age of the deep? How many times has that happened? Is this cycle even something we can ever escape from, or is it just the natural life cycle of this universe? Universe. How many times have the Four Lords found their souls in the flame? We find the old Pale Drake, old Dead One, old King, and old Witch souls in our New Game Plus cycle. How many times have these souls been reincarnated? How many beings have acted as vessels for them? Were Nito, Gwyn, Isleth, and Seath the first Lords? Or were they just the first Four Lords we knew of? Why has humanity transcended the use of the Lord Vessel? Why does it lie in the basement of the Majula Manor, neglected, broken, and dead? Why is Ornstein here? 
or a manifestation of him? Artorius' sword in Broom Tower, why is that there? Who are the giants of Drangleic to be so different in appearance from Lordran? Why do their souls power automatons? Most of these questions can be answered in the most meta sense with things like, it's an easter egg, or it was developed by a different team, or even it was unfinished so they did that to save time. But in game, these questions follow me everywhere. Explanations such as passage of time, I guess, became even more tenuous with the introduction of Dark Souls 3, which canonically happens after Dark Souls 2, which seems to retcon so much and chisel away at the legitimacy of a game I genuinely think asked some of the most provocative questions in the series. Personally, I think I came to resent a lot of the fan backlash to Dark Souls 2 when I finally came around to play Dark Souls 3. I don't mean to be controversial, but Dark Souls 3 is a pretty okay game. It's definitely alright, it's certainly playable, sometimes even enjoyably so, and the peaks in quality came in the areas that were new, Archdragon Peak and the Nameless King, the latter half of Lothric Castle, and the Ring City being absolute standouts of the series. The game, however, was utterly dragged down by the sheer amount of fan service. Fan service that had been demanded. People had been crowing for more Dark Souls for a long time, and many were furious with Dark Souls 2, a game that loosely fit the Souls mould but took its own direction. And Dark Souls 3 has some key examples of FromSoft pandering to the loudest fan expectations at the cost of making a truly original piece of work. Dark Souls 3's Let It Die message was insanely compelling, like the back of a shampoo bottle when you've forgotten to take your phone to the toilet with you. But between the return of Gwendolyn, Anne Orlando, Andre the Blacksmith, Sigurd 2.0, the Storm Ruler, the Demon Ruins, Firelink Shrine, and, although largely contested because it was a pretty great fight, the Soul of Cinder, there wasn't much of a new story to be told, just hours upon hours of, hey, remember this? Wasn't this awesome when it was novel? Now it's old and dead, sorry. I ran into so many cocky fans who smirkingly insist that Dark Souls 3 is Dark Souls 2, but don't talk about that other game, rejecting a genuinely enjoyable instalment of the Souls series that tried to do something different, and did succeed, but just not in a way they wanted it to. No one can deny that Dark Souls 2 was hardly the product it was supposed to be at launch. Least of all me, and I've just written 19 pages on this fucking game. Huge areas were cut from the game, literally an entire civilization scrubbed away at the last moment, and the entire way the game was intended to be approached was stripped back and refit. I am, however, going to say something controversial. I believe that none of the game feels unfinished. Comparatively speaking, Dark Souls 1 had some really glaring problems in the latter half of the game. Lost Isolith, a sprawling monolith buried deep beneath the earth, was foreshadowed throughout the game as an underground fortress of magma, home to a coven of powerful witches, out of which torrents of demons spewed, dragging themselves up through Blighttown and terrorising the inhabitants of Undeadburg. When you pass by this place and the Tomb of Giants, look down into Lost Isolith through a crack in the earth, you see the brittle remains of a ruined civilization, and you are so ready to go there. And then when you get there, it's just a nest of angry, fire-breathing testicles. Many have commented that the game declines hugely in quality in the second half. Once you've grabbed the Lord Vessel, barring the DLC of course, which is mint, the final trek to each of the four lords is a bit of an anticlimax. The lords themselves were a joke, with the minor exception of the four kings, who could be pretty tough. But then again, there were four of them. I'm sure four seaths would have been ass. I never noticed this in Dark Souls 2. Sure, all the areas were much smaller versions of the original vision, but aside from one location I'll raise later, they feel like neatly encapsulated, well-designed areas with clear progress, distinctive appearance and atmosphere, and unique enemies and encounters. Dark Souls 2 was known for its gank battles, many of which were redistributed in Scholar of the First Sin, but they're not hard to accustom on oneself too, and eventually you become very comfortable with dealing with multiple attackers at once. Sure, some areas can be zipped through in less than a minute, see the whole quarter of the game leading to Black Gulch, plus the Dragon Eyrie which they allow you to skip through entirely in Scholar, but every aspect of these areas were painstakingly modelled fresh, all with their own unique enemies and a shocking amount of content crammed into such a tiny place. I never arrived at a Lost Isolith reincarnation, always a new, winding area with loads to explore, thorough level design, and clear, consistent progress to be made. Moreover, Dark Souls 2 makes excellent use of horizontal and vertical space, sometimes masterfully combining them to make each level truly interesting to traverse. The Black Gulch is a great example of good use of vertical space, being that, like a delicious pie, the good bits are hidden below the crust and you'd never know unless you dug in. The gutter, for all its flaws, has a similar strength, combining vertical and horizontal to disorient the player in a sea of rickety homes and bridges. The way Hyde's Tower of Flame points like an arrowhead, with the Dragon Rider and the Dragon Slayer on each 
opposite tip, the slayer elevated in the cathedral while the rider is sunken in the Colosseum, offers a dichotomy you can't even appreciate until they're both beaten. No Man's Wharf curves around itself, every aspect of the map visible to the player, with the clear goal, the distant bell, calling to them like a siren song. The Forest of Fallen Giants offers excellent horizontal traversal through hidden breakable walls, points of no return, and various winding paths that will steal you away from the main objective. The same can be said for the Shrine of Amana, the focus being entirely on the horizontal nature of the map, having to use a torch to see the deadly drops below more clearly, but rendering themselves more visible to enemies lurking below the surface. The game also varies its environment so wildly. You go from the stormy, depressing Lost Bastille to the rotting Harvest Valley, to the sunken volcanic keep, then down into the depths below Majula to a gulch poisoned by the dragon of the Sanctum City hidden below. Each offers such varied mechanics, the invisible enemies of the Misty Woods, the bell ringers of the Undead Crypt, and the tournaments of the Dragon Eyrie, you're always traversing, be it underground or up a mountain, be it towards the coast or the mainland, you're always making progress. Dark Souls 2 offers the most varied, intriguing variety of land and level, hands down. Cycles of life, death, and rebirth are prevalent throughout the Souls series, but Dark Souls 2 doesn't sit content with that. The rule of three plays a key role throughout Dark Souls 2, most notably in the DLCs, which are by far considered to be the highlight of the game. The three DLCs are based around three of the most notable knights of Drang Lake's time. The Sunken King, the Old Iron King, and the Burnt Ivory King, and their respective kingdoms, are visited in search of their crowns. Only by uniting these crowns with Vendrix can one cure the curse of the undead, or at least hide the symptoms for a single person, as long as they're wearing it, which, when you think about it, is probably the most useless hat ever. Each kingdom is based on poison, burn, and frost, each with a focus on different angles of gameplay, those being puzzles, combat, and exploration, respectively. Each DLC also centres around the three daughters of Manus, Alana, the Squalid Queen, Nadalia, Bride of Ash, and Alsana, Silent Oracle, which, combined with Nashandra, parallel the four horsemen of the apocalypse as pestilence, war, famine, and death, respectively. Alana, the Squalid Queen, can be encountered at the end of Shulver, a sunken city poisoned from the inside by an ancient grey dragon, Sin. It's a puzzle-based experience, the objective of the level is gaining access to the inner sanctum, which is inaccessible on first entry. Your journey orbits you around the sanctum, through the city of Shulver, into outer sanctum buildings, and down to the dragon sanctum on the base of the cavern. The city is crammed full of puzzles. Glowing obelisks can be hit, which trigger nearby buildings to rise and fall, which was probably a nightmare for the residents, but can be used as new platforms to journey between. Most of the bonfires are hidden too, so unless you like the idea of absolutely pegging it through the city every time you die, you'll need to think smart to find them. The Dragon Sanctum features invulnerable wraiths that can only be killed once their host bodies are destroyed. Trap floors, spikes, and mechanisms of death, and rotating doors whose nearby pressure plates need to be found and triggered. I have to say, having to focus on figuring out puzzles whilst being pursued and beaten by insanely tough enemies can be a pretty exhausting endeavour. I like that this DLC attempted something new, I appreciated the change and loved the visuals, but it had had the potential to get very draining very quickly. At the end, you fight the source of the poison plague himself, Sin, and in an amazing crescendo bring him down and take the crown for yourself. Nadalia, the Bride of Ash, greets you as you step into Broom Tower, the location for the second DLC, by resurrecting a bunch of ashen zombies to destroy you on her behalf. This DLC is centred around destroying her idols, mediums for her lingering spirit long after her death, to collect all the pieces of her soul and get a lovely napkin for your troubles. Broom Tower makes excellent use of vertical space in a way that somehow makes absolute sense, but is also completely disorientating. The towers all have distinct features, appearances, and amenities, but you'll still end up wandering aimlessly for hours and hours, hopelessly lost in your pursuit of the shards of Nadalia's soul. Every fight is hard as balls, too, with huge enemies that pummel you with massive chicken drumsticks. Speaking of balls, every boss fight in this DLC is pretty quality, all things considered. The Fume Knight does have this classic janky hitbox, but the Smelter Demon and Sir Alon are pretty tough, but also plenty fair. Just a shame they're at the end of random co-op areas that are nightmares on a solo run. Just drop you into a segment of gameplay with way too many enemies. If you're playing solo, you just take them out until they respawn, or pelt past them to the boss fog and try not to die on the way. Also, if you do summon for the areas and fight the bosses in co-op, their attacks are usually boosted so significantly that, for example, most of the blue smelter demon's attacks kill me in one hit. I ended up dying so much that I became really scared to get involved, lest I disappoint my co-op cohorts even more. Difficult to suggest ways to improve these areas for 
co-op in ways that wouldn't make it impossible for solo players, for example having to open two or three mechanisms at the same time, as this would make them impossible for solo. However, if you removed the mechanism entirely for solo players, then they'd have an enormous advantage. Advantage in what though? Weighing it up? I think I'd take that trade. It would be more fun for co-op players, but it would be much easier for solo, even if it was much more boring. The final fight as you face off against her boyfriend, squire, adopted son? Rain, aka the Fume Knight, in the basement is definitely the high point of this DLC. The final DLC, and for me, the weakest area in the entire game, takes us to Elium Lois, a frozen, dead wasteland, at the epicenter of which sits Ulsana, the silent oracle. The basis of this DLC is exploration. You need to explore to find the Eye of the Priestess, which renders visible both the first boss and a bunch of enemies dotted around the level, making it relevant to do another sweep. Once you've beaten that boss, you can speak to Ulsana and she'll rescind the ice she has across the land, opening up more avenues for adventure and more loot to collect. From here, you need to assemble your army of Lois Knights, who are sat mournfully around the kingdom like they genuinely have nothing better to do. It's a shame the DLC is so rushed. Lud and Zalin, the co-op bosses of the region, are just twin reskins of Arva, who has her own hitbox problems to address. Except now, of course, there's double trouble. At the end of a completely bare valley of ice, with only a few ruins dotted across the landscape, sure, it's frigid outskirts, but that doesn't mean it has to be completely boring. At least in the other DLCs, they had some unique bosses. The Burnt Ivory King fight I also found quite lacklustre. Like it hadn't been tested thoroughly enough. The Ivory Knights aren't particularly good at distracting the enemies nor doing damage. They were cool though, and fitted well with the exploration theme for the DLC. Running around this frozen wasteland, finding these guys, politely waiting in their little huts on their tiny thrones, felt like assembling the Avengers. Except shit, because they don't do any damage. The concept of the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse is explored so clearly here. Nishandra manifests as death, seducing and overcoming Vendrick until it was too late and he had to flee below ground. Alana, pestilence, sings to sin until he bloats with poison and, when he awakens, spews plague with such intensity that it rises through the dirt and infects the gulch above. War, Nadalia, her body turned to ash, haunts Broom Tower and the frenzied inhabitants thereof, reincarnating them at a moment's notice to fight on her behalf, thriving in the fire. Alsana, famine, sits atop her icy barren kingdom, having turned the place to frost, forbidding anything from growing again. The question goes unanswered, did they come to Lordran to bring about the apocalypse, or did they find their place here because it had already happened. conclusion, please stop dropping a hard R on me because I enjoy this game. And yeah, before you say it, I am butthurt. People always say, aww, you butthurt because people disagree with you. No, I'm butthurt because I met you 15 seconds ago and you've already called me a stupid shithead. If you did this in person, I'd think you were a sociopath. I'm butthurt because this basic lack of human decency seems to be completely acceptable on the internet, and people would rather sneer at someone who's been crucified for sharing an opinion instead of pointing out the problem with the behaviour of their cohorts. The bottom line is, Dark Souls 2 is different. People wanted more of the same, it did not provide and they got pissed off. People wanted just Dark Souls again, with little deviation, little experimentation. They wanted Dark Souls 3. Yeah, I mean Dark Souls 2 did make some dumb decisions, but it also made some great ones. Dark Souls 2 is an experience completely unlike Dark Souls 1, 3, Bloodborne or Sekiro. It should never have been named Dark Souls 2 because it's a fucking good game. But it's different, so it gets all the hatred on the planet. It's a good game, it might not be a Dark Souls game, but it is good. As someone who loves the game, I would be completely on board if they'd called it something else. Call of Drang Lake, Grand Theft Sword, Medjula Crossing. Maybe then it would be eligible for a sequel. Thank you very much for watching my review of Dark Souls 2. I've tried to make this as all-encompassing as possible, so I apologise if it was a bit heavy on the details. As you can see, I absolutely love this game, but anyone can acknowledge its flaws, me included. If you liked this video, please consider liking the video and even subscribing to the channel. I stream daily on Twitch and try to deliver videos as frequently as I can here on YouTube. Thank you as always to my patrons and my editor, me, I was today's editor. Criticisms and feedback are welcome and encouraged. Thank you for watching everybody and I hope to see you